let there be peace on earth, let it begin with me. What are the things that make for peace? So, Father, today we pray that you would open our hearts, open our eyes to what your Spirit would teach us, things that Jesus taught about peace, the things that your Word teaches about peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. The background to this is the, the triumphal entry. Jesus has ridden into town on the, on the donkey. The people are cheering. They think peace on earth is coming. The Messiah, one that's going to rule over the world from Jerusalem. And the nations will come and uh, we'll walk in his light. And they thought literally that Jesus was going to fulfill that in their time. And that day was to be kind of his coronation, recognition. When he drew near and saw the city, he didn't rejoice, say, look at all these people that are impressed by me. And he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. They were looking for him to do a political, uh, military thing, and that's going to bring peace, but that wouldn't, it never has, uh, never will, it was just in the an outward enforced thing. Uh, the things that make for peace are now hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. He wept because they didn't recognize the visitation. Uh, that he was there not to just to throw off their enemies politically, but he was there to bring them peace inside, the things that make for peace. Uh, Colossians 1.20 says, And through him, through Jesus, to reconcile, bring together to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Things that make for peace, made for our peace, was a sacrifice that Jesus did upon the cross. He poured out his blood, laid his life down for us. That's why we have peace. And that's ultimately what we're going to talk about somewhat today is when we lay down our lives. That's how we're going to have peace in our, in our families, in our communities, and nation. But uh, this here he is talking about, I wish you knew for the things that would make for peace. And it's not, as we talked last week, it's not compromising watering down things. You know, I saw a deal recently that somebody said the Catholic Church is being so uh, intolerant when they, people that are uh, out of line with scriptural teachings, they won't allow them to receive communion. They won't allow them to be baptized. Uh, don't they realize they're going to drive people away? If they require these things, they should be dialoguing, listening to these people instead of issuing these things. Well, what are the things that make for peace? When you lay down your defenses, when you lay down your, uh, the things that you have convictions about, uh, good fences are necessary because they, they explain the expectations that you have. When we, uh, we have a fence between our house and the neighbors, uh, I remember when Bill Lester was there, I, I told him, good fences make good neighbors. You know, I expect that this is where my dog is allowed to go and not allowed to go. Uh, this is, ball gets thrown over the fence and we'll throw it back, but you need permission to enter in and, and, and to go onto that property. Uh, if that fence is not there, there can be all kinds of misunderstandings. And we don't, you know, so, well, I didn't know, uh, you know, that was the line. I didn't know you didn't want to be uh, by over, overstepping the boundaries there. Uh, in a marriage, there need to be fences. What kind of a marriage would succeed if there was an understanding that, yeah, this is my wife and I am committed to her and she to me and there are uh, others to be involved in appropriately in that way? If you want peace, you need some fences. You need some boundaries. We talked last week about the fact of having a sense of what God is directing in our lives. Uh, there are so many things that we could be doing and 
would like to do maybe, but we have to have a sense that God is directing me, that that's not an area that I should, uh, I should head for. Uh, it's going to take away time from the other things that are God's priorities for me, and I can just have a peace. Uh, do you hear me? You can have a peace about saying no. <laughs> don't say no. You don't care about him saying no. I really just don't feel like that's, I'm going to be able to, to help you in that area. And, uh, you know, I need help doing that, but there can, you, can, you can say no and have peace about it, because that is the thing that makes for peace, having boundaries. Why do I say that? Well, the next verse is, if you were to look at Luke chapter 19, Jesus goes into the temple. Things are out of order. This, my house is to be called a house of prayer. He made it a den of things. And so he starts turning over tables, starts driving out the money changers. He didn't lose his temper. Uh, he was firm. It says that he, he, he actually, one of the Gospels said that he fashioned a whip. He braided a whip. It wasn't like he just blew his top and went mad because they're doing this, but he said, you know, there's something that needs to be dealt with here, so I'm going to braid this whip together. I'm going to take it in my hand. Let people know that I mean business. Uh, the things that make for peace in the temple, in those days, the things that were so out of line with God's purpose, Jesus was concerned that God's peace would be there, not just a compromise like, oh, okay, let's let you go ahead and do your thing. And so he says, I wish he wept over Jerusalem. He said, I wish you knew the things that make for peace. And then the next thing he did was go cleanse the temple. And if we want peace in our hearts and our homes, we need to cleanse the temple. We need to set some boundaries. We need to say, uh, this is, uh, is acceptable and this is not. So Romans 14, 19, that, that phrase, the things that make for peace, was just in my mind. I looked it up, found it there. In Luke 19, there's another place that occurs. It's Romans 14 and verse 19. New King James Version says, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which we may one may edify another. Are we looking for things that will make peace? Is that important to us? Or we just want to get our way things that will benefit us? And uh, do, we, do we want just to make our point? You know, Jesus didn't ride into Jerusalem on a, on a war horse. He rode on a donkey, uh, a peaceful uh, type animal. They were, uh, you know, most military men didn't ride around on donkeys. They rode on these powerful steeds, war horses. When we come into situations which are uh, unrestful and, and fraught with friction and hostility and people that don't agree with us, do we ride in on a war horse with our armor? <laughs> or do we ride in on a donkey? Uh, that's the things that make for peace are our attitudes so many times. I want to talk about two people in the Old Testament. Lately we've been reading in our morning prayer time from Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. But uh, Nehemiah was an interesting man. He was the governor of, over Jerusalem, assigned by the king to come into to, uh, the, the walls needed to be rebuilt of the city. And I'm talking about boundaries. How can you have peace in Jerusalem when you don't have walls round about you to say, you know, you're not coming in, enemy? Uh, people that were bringing in merchants and things, coming in on the Sabbath day, there weren't any walls or gates to keep them out. And so he was distressed because the gates were. Uh, broken down, and burned with fire, and the walls, they've been stumbling over rubble for maybe a hundred years. They had the temple rebuilt. And that's good that we have, you know, the, the Lord comes to dwell, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, but now you need to set some boundaries around about you, uh, in addition to that. And uh, Nehemiah came, and he got the wall built, but then he, he went back to uh, Babylon, where he was the cupbearer to the king, and returned. We're not sure how many, how long it was. A few years. He came back already. The people had backslid, 
and uh, were marrying into the tribes around about them. Nehemiah 13, 23. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab. These are the nations where they sacrificed their children to the, to the idols and to immorality as part of their worship and everything else. So they had intermarried with them and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and they could not speak the language of Judah and only the language of each people. So these kids don't even know the Jewish language. They are uh, learning the languages of Moab and Ammonites uh, and uh, it, something burned in Nehemiah's spirit. That would be something that bothers us, causes us to rise up and say, this is wrong. And I'm not just going to say, oh, let's have peace so I'll let it go on. There won't be any ultimate peace if you continue down that road. Uh, and so Nehemiah is not the pattern for church discipline. I understand, but it just shared you with uh, you to get an idea of how vehement he was that things would be in the right order. You know, Jesus cleansing the temple, the things that make for peace. Uh, you might say, if we're going to have a peaceful nation, we got to deal with some things here. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. That is an interesting passage of Scripture. As I say, it's not the pattern for church discipline. It's the pattern of a man that had something burning in him and said, This is just not right. We're going to have peace in Jerusalem. We have to deal with these things. I, uh, I'm not sure that he did the right thing there, the way that he went about it. Uh, the Bible doesn't say what Nehemiah did was good. It just says this is what he did. He was a man of passion. Uh, and we need to be careful. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God, it says in the book of James. And I'm not condemning him. I'm not saying I figured out that he was wrong. I'm just saying there's more than one way to approach a situation, namely Ezra. He it was, Ezra was a priest. Nehemiah was a governor, a political appointment figure. Ezra was a, a, a priest of God. And uh, he had come back with the times earlier when they were building the temple and getting it going. Not the wall yet, but Ezra 9 1 says, After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, The people of Israel and the priests. And the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations. From the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons. That the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. Here they come to to the promised land, they rebuild the temple, they're restoring the worship of God, and they're getting away. The things that make for peace are when we walk in God's ways, in the light of His Word, His Spirit. They totally were, you know, wonderful that these people had left, and Babylon were coming out there, but they had gotten off track, and their children were getting off track. Now, remember what Nehemiah said he pulled the hair out of the people. Uh, look what Ezra did, the man of God here. It says, as soon as I heard this, I tore my garment, my cloak, and pulled hair from my head and beard. And sat upon him. Sat upon. He was, made him tear his hair out. The, you know, the thing that was not peaceful. That's a phrase we use when we're just so, so distressed. It just makes me want to tear my hair out. Well, instead of tearing out their hair, he tore his own hair out. And I sat appalled. I just sat down out in the city square. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. A very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. 
What are the things that make for peace? There are times that we just have to come down hard. And, but oftentimes that's just an outward thing that intimidates people. And once we're gone and the punishment is uh, not so much an issue anymore, then they revert back to him. But here Ezra sits, he pulls out his own hair. He sits down and just begins to weep. Uh, he's casting himself down in front of the house of God. And people start gathering around. And they began to weep bitterly as well. Because they, the Spirit of God was working in them. The things that make for peace are when we ourselves feel such a burden uh, that we, are, we share that with other people, not by pulling their hair out so much as pulling our own hair out. Does it make you pull your hair out when you see the problems that are around about you? I uh, have shared before, once again, because of the beauties of recording, I get to get these on tape before, before they disappear. But uh, when I was uh, a kid, my younger brother Dave was a true agitator, maybe mad, two years younger than me, and did things that, uh, that uh, you know, just got, made me want to pull my hair out. But uh, I pulled his out instead of <laughs> more what, ha what happened. But I remember one time, I can still picture uh, in the house out on, on Rosa Drive, out Zilla, the old ranch house on the cattle ranch. But uh, David had done something so irritating to me. My mother was standing there and I picked up my hand. I was going to slap him across the face. She said, don't you dare, Donnie. I thought about it. I said, you know, it's going to be worth it. So I did. <coughs> I started crying and I headed up for my room to, to take the punishment. I thought it's going to be worth it. I don't care how hard a spanking I get. Well, my dad came up to the room and he said, do you know how much that hurt? Your mother, when you did that, when you disrespected her, you know how much it hurts me that you disrespected your mother and I have to see her uh, go through that. He didn't say anything about poor little baby. <laughs> he said, you, you just, you see the hurt in my heart, your mother's heart. What you do? I said, I'm not going to spank you, but I want you to consider, you know, that what you've done is brought grief to us and I don't want you ever to do that again. Wow. <laughs> The things that make for peace are not just spankings, but when people see our heart, when they realize, when they can see things from a, from a new perspective. 2 Timothy chapter 2.24, talking about church discipline here, I think this would be more the Ezra model than the Nehemiah or the New Testament here, but it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God for adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. When you come on to people in such a violent uh, way, that it, usually what it does is, is it raises their defenses. People that are already in the, in the throes of, of, of defending themselves and trying to excuse what they have done and, and people who come, want to come at you. The, verse 26, we do it so that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. People that are involved in wrong are often uh, ensnared by the devil. Are we going to beat the devil out of them? No. <laughs> As we come to them and share in that brokenness of heart like Ezra did, as Paul told Timothy, the young pastor there, don't get up on your high horse and start, you know, jumping on people. I heard that in law school somebody said they tell you if you if you have a strong case, then pound the points. Drive it home. If you have a weak case, then pound the table. Try and really look important and, and get their attention and raise emotions because you don't have anything factual to defend your plan. Well. We need to pound the points, not the pulpit, not the podium, whatever it is. Uh, but the greatest thing that will pound into people's hearts uh, are when they know that we love them, that we care, that we're going to not just exchange insults, but exchange ideas, hear what they have to say. I uh, recently had a person that was, was uh, very upset at me, and I started 
uh, you know, well, frankly, it said, I, I know you wrestled in high school, but you come for me, but you see what happened. <laughs> and I, uh, I realized I need to back off here. I'm not going to convince this person of anything uh, by my rising up and trying to tear his hair out. I need to tear my own heart, my own hair. Uh, and, and I backed off. I did back off from the points that I felt needed to be made, but I said I need to come in the spirit of Christ, the, the spirit of on the, on the throne of, of heaven in the book of Revelation. It's not the lamb that's seated there, it's the, it's the lamb. It's not the lion, it's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Uh, and we can come on like a lion or we can come like a lamb. There are times and circumstances where we have to come on strong. I'm not denying that, but in most of our interpersonal relationships, things that make for peace are not when we come on like gangbusters and trying to uh, cram our truth down other people's throats. It's when they see that we care about it. Those people in the Ezra's day, they knew that he had come back he had this burden for the city. He cared about them. That he was burdened by the things that they were doing. Uh, and uh, because of his heart, they gathered around. They began to weep. Something happens in them. May we be people that promote peace in our own hearts, then the, in the hearts of those around about us. Abraham Lincoln is quoted as saying, the best way to get rid of an enemy is to make him your friend. Uh, and uh, so many things we do just make people drive farther and farther away from us. And once again, I'm not talking about compromising our convictions, but I'm talking about compromising our own self-righteousness, our own self-will, uh, our own desire to dominate and be there. Peace is an important thing in our, you know, what do we put on the gravestones? Rest in peace. What did the first thing the angels said? Peace on earth. Is that potential for there? When Jesus sent his disciples out uh, to minister, Luke 10, verse 5, it says, Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, a person that promotes peace, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. When you come into a situation and say, I peace. I want to bring peace into this. I am declaring peace to this house. There are people that will respond. Your peace will rest upon them. If not, it will return to you. And you go on your way. They don't just try to pound peace into people or convince them of things. My, uh, uh, in our home, in the, growing up, uh, there was peace in our house. I even remember at least one, one of my friends uh, my brother's friend actually, uh, my brother said, you know, he, he likes to come to our house because his house, there's so much bickering, there's so much fighting and unrest. He said, I like to come into your house just because I feel peace. I, do we project peace? Is it coming from inside to us to where it's evident? Uh, the other day, I can't remember what the circumstances were, but uh, one of our family members was kind of rising up, just joking around. And all of a sudden, our dog jumped up and ran over, looking up at him, like, what's going on here? I don't like this. Even the dog can sense <laughs> there's no peace in this house, and maybe other people could as well. That uh, uh, the, the thing of peace be to this house. That's the, Jesus said, go to your house before you go out, casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead. Find a house. And declare peace to this house. Uh, I declare peace to my house. I pray you would declare peace to your house, which is going to come as we lay down our own self will and self righteousness. Luke 24, verse 36 the disciples, Jesus had died, they didn't realize the resurrection, and, and the ones that had gone to Emmaus and all, they come back and were telling them, and they were all not at peace. They were trying to what the world's going on here? As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? 
we try and figure things out. Doubts arise in our hearts. What we need is Jesus in the room with us. Jesus in our home with us. Jesus in our, as we're in the cars, and the road rage is uh, attempting to arise about us. Uh, peace to you. Jesus is saying to you, peace to you. Yeah, but then, well, forget about that. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart once you let me just handle things? There is a very practical thing of advice I give you is if you want one of the things that make for peace, well, stop watching the evening news and start watching Hallmark movies. <laughs> Every one just about begins, you can tell who's going to marry who because they always bump into each other, knock over packages or do something and they're at odds with each other to begin with, but then they, they find out that the other person is not so bad. You know, the, the person that loves Christmas, the other person is a Grinch uh, and uh, judgmental and looking down. But then you find out, well, that person, their mother died on Christmas or their fiance broke up with them or something. That's why they're down on Christmas. And, and there is a healing that takes place as, as people come together. Watch the evening news and all the violence. We, we haven't had a, the evening news on our house in uh, many months. I uh, still get the news feeds off of the internet and all that's plenty, but but uh, I like it at the end of a Hallmark movie when I have to avert my face to my wife doesn't know I'm in tears and now these people are getting together. Things are being resolved and healing is, is taking place. Another practical thing, what are the things that make for peace? Turn on some worship music. Play an instrument, get out and begin playing. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, they were going to war against the enemy, but they weren't sure how to approach it. They called Elisha, and Elisha says, well, we're going to get the mind of the Lord here, he says in 2 Kings 3.15, but now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came on him. If you just settle down and let uh, let music soothe the wild beast, charms the wild beast, the music and do much. It's a gift of God to help our spirits to refocus, recalibrate, to sing worship songs, to, to open your Bible, to take a scripture that you've memorized in the past and just begin to quote it. These are things that make for peace. Psalm 131, three verses. You memorize that. And quote this when you're getting out of peace. But O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. And I just, I realize my place. We get into situations and we think, what can I do here? How can I help? How can I solve this problem for them or for me? Well, one of the ways is to say, my heart's not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I don't occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. I haven't got the resources, I don't have the intelligence, I don't have what I need to, to meet this. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. It's a picture of a child that's resting on its mother's breast that is uh, just calm. The, the, the peacefulness that comes with that. We need to, we need to lay our heads on Jesus' shoulder, on his chest, and say, Lord, here are the things that are round about me, and I'm so distressed. A child may have all kinds of concerns, worries in its heart, but you lay that child on his mother, and suddenly things are different. The mother's going to watch out for me. The mother's going to take care of me, find the things that are necessary. When we come from that attitude, instead of I'm running around trying to set everything right, you know, I'm Remember the uh, Frank Cole, our district superintendent, telling about a, a little boy that uh, his dad was leaving on a business trip, and he told his little uh, three-year-old, five-year-old son, you're going to be the man of the house. You take care of things while I'm gone, okay? Pretty soon after into his business trip, the, the man's wife called and said, will you please tell your son to back off? He's trying to take care of me in every little detail. <laughs> he can't even tie his own shoes. Well, there are things I can't even tie my own shoes, but I can trust that God's going to work them out. Oh, Israel, 
hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Daniel had peace in the lion's den. The, children, the Hebrew children earlier in the book of Daniel, they, if we, you know, God's able to take us through this. But if he doesn't, we'll still serve him. We, we're not out of peace. They weren't running around all uh, nervous and upset and anxious. They just said, go ahead, throw us in the fire. There's a peace in our hearts. It turned out that the fourth man in the fire was there and only their, only their ropes were burned off their wrists. Esther going into the king when it was a dangerous thing to do unless you were summoned, your head would be cut off. You would be killed unless you extended the golden slip, uh, scepter. But she said, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do it. She had a Half the battle is just coming to the place of peace and saying, you know what, I need to do this. I'm going to do it. Jesus went to the cross. Gethsemane was such an agony that he sweat, as it were, drops of blood, but he just decided, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. He had a peace in his heart. As he went up to the cross, he wasn't screaming and shouting and yelling at people. He just set his face and went uh, and... In our hearts and lives, that we think that, that we just have to go through. But we can go through them with peace. We don't have to uh, have peace, doesn't come from circumstances being smooth. It comes from our hearts having a cool spirit, that sense of who God is and what He is.